Thank you. Good morning. Glad to see everybody out. And uh, yes, I'm going to talk about lawnmowers this morning. <laughs> and you say, well, what kind of lessons can you learn from the lawnmower? But we'll find out. So uh, it's something that I've done uh, my junior and senior year in high school. I had 33 yards every weekend to try to do. And you learn to get pretty fast and try to keep up with it. But uh, there are some weekends that uh, she couldn't quite get to it. And it would rain. And next thing you know, you start getting a little bit behind and, and uh, all of these type of things. And I think we all had to deal with problems with the lawnmower. So uh, again, it is something that uh, we can learn from at times. We just don't always realize uh, what we can learn. Uh, the first one uh, we want to talk about, tall grass is harder to cut. Anybody have that problem? <laughs> get uh, real tall grass, you get behind, and all of a sudden you got to try to catch up. And we had that happen quite a few times out at Eric's, uh, that we get uh, just buried uh, at times because we couldn't get to everything as we want to. But the thing is, it becomes very difficult uh, because it clogs up the mower. And you got to, sometimes it'll shut you down. You gotta try to clean it out before you try to restart it and things on that order. And I've had yards that uh, I had to mow that looked like this one over here uh, because there've been maybe a couple weekends I couldn't get to it. And uh, when, you, when you have that type of grass and, and that many, you try to do as fast as you can. Uh, my wife and boys always told me I looked like I was running with the lawnmower. Uh, but you got used to it and, and uh, you had to try to get much done as much as possible. But the fact is, uh, when it comes down to tall grass, it is difficult to cut. And sometimes it is really thick in spots, uh, maybe an underground spring. And you'll be mowing along and it'll be real uh, thin and then all of a sudden you hit a patch that... Uh, you have to really slow down to, to mow through it. And it takes a little bit longer to, to cut it. But the lesson we need to learn from that is not to put off dealing with problems because it just makes it worse. The reason we get tall grass is because we had to put it off, right? And sometimes within our life, we have a difficulty that we have problems within our life that we must deal with. And the scriptures tell us that we must do these things as fast as we can. Take care of it. Don't put it off. And we always like to do that at times. We always like to put things off and, and wait a little longer. Uh, when I want to try to straighten up the house, I think, well, I got tomorrow. Uh, I can do that. Or, or uh, I can see the dishes sitting in the sink and they say, well, I'll get to it later uh, this evening. And then next thing you know, you wake up the next morning and it's still there. <laughs> still the problem. But uh, the thing is, we do put things off. It read in Matthew, the fifth chapter, beginning with verse 23. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there remembers that thy brother has ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to that brother, then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thy adversary quickly while thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversaries deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou shalt be cast into prison. What did he say? Deal with it when? How? Quickly. Take care of the problem. If you have a problem with someone, you deal with it as soon as possible. Don't keep putting it off because eventually... It's going to be set off to the side, and maybe there will be some anger that will build up because uh, not understanding uh, what each other is, is trying to do or teach, and things on this order, and there's problems that comes up from that. And sometimes we get other people involved. And actually, when it should have been dealt with between those two individuals, right then and there, as fast as they, as quickly as possible. And we had that uh, problem within our life, that we keep trying to put things off. And uh, Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verses 26 and 27, 
It says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Never give place to the devil. If you're angry about something, what are you supposed to do with it? You're supposed to deal with it. Now, I always find out throughout the years of, of, of growing and age that if you have a difficulty with, uh, say, a husband and wife got into it, uh, sometimes it's better off just to sit down and, and say, we'll discuss it here in a little bit. And we separate for a little bit, and then about an hour later, maybe sit down and discuss it when no anger is going on at that time. I always use the excuse that, uh, and, and the saying that uh, Marshall Dillon used to say uh, on Gunsmoke. He said, I went to bed mean, woke up meaner. And sometimes we do that. We put that anger aside and we sleep on it, and then the next morning we make it worse than what it will actually turn out to be. Now, what we do, we deal with it. We, we take care of that problem at that time. I remember, uh, you know, use Marie for example, when we first got married, uh, she changed peanut butter in trying to make them no bake cookies. And I came home from work, and she, she says, here, try it. Well, it's a little bit more oily than usually uh, when she made it. I didn't know she made the, the uh, changed peanut butter in it, and she asked me how I liked it. And I was like, well, it's a little bit oily. <laughs> well, guess what? She got upset and ran upstairs and bawled. Now, I'm standing down there going, what did I do? I, I didn't say anything wrong. <laughs> yeah, well, I had to go up and try to deal with that problem at that time. I had to take care of it. And we it found out that because she did change the peanut Peter butter and it was oily, it caused a little bit more problem in, in the cookie. And we discussed it and uh, took care of that problem at that point. And it, it I laugh about it now, but... Uh, but it's something that you do and you deal with. So if you have a problem with somebody, you deal with it. Don't let the anger creep in. If it does, it makes it worse. It will lead you to sin at this point. David did not deal with Absalom after the, the death of Adam. And look what happened because of it. There were problems that was created in, in the fact that the uh, David's life, and Absalom was was put to death, and uh, he was hanging from a tree, and his David did not want him uh, killed at that time, and it cost Ammon uh, his life at that problem. And if there's a problem with sin, we need to take care of it as soon as possible. If we find out that we're doing things contrary to God's word, we don't wait weeks or months and say, "Well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to quit." We take care of that problem. If I know I'm doing something wrong and I found out, I try to put a stop to it at that time. And it's difficult. Because like I say, we like to put things off. We like to shove it to the side a little bit. That's why we got uh, wives giving that honey to do list at times and, and we got to be reminded because we keep putting it off. But we do that with sin. We keep thinking, well, I'll, I'll take care of this sin later uh, as I come along and, and grow as a Christian. And we need to start working on it as soon as possible. As long as we discuss it and, and, and find out what we need to do, we need to take care of it. And that's the same way of cutting grass and tall grass. You take care of the problem before it becomes that problem that we face. Other problems is dull blades don't cut. <laughs> you ever have a push mower that uh, had a dull blade and, and you almost have to go over it twice and sometimes three times uh, to get the grass cut? Well, sometimes uh, when we try to cut dull with a dull blade, it just breaks the grass 
and we got to keep going over, and sometimes it looks pretty messy, uh, as this uh, yard does, and it has a problem, and uh, it, it don't look good. And sometimes we, as Christians, uh, get a little dull, because we have a dull mind. In 2 Timothy, 2nd chapter, verse 15, be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a workman that not, need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. How often do you study your Bible? I mean, study. When I say read it, study it. How often do we remember the things that we have studied? I know when I quit the church for, I think, a period of about 12 years, and when I came back, I realized there was a lot I forgot because I didn't keep at it. And we do that. And not only do we do that with, with the Scriptures, and we become dull-minded at times, but we do that with other things. My sister-in-law daughter called one night and said, uh, hey, I, I have problems with allergies. Can you help me? Uh, <laughs> okay, it's been quite a few years since I've been out of school. <laughs> uh, give me an example of what they have in the book. And when she did that, they came back. And I was able to help her. And she was tickled to death the grade she got the, the following day. But I got dull because I didn't use it for all these years. I had to be brought back to remembrance. And sometimes we do that as Christians. When we study God's Word, we don't handle the Bible properly. And we don't unless we sit down and actually study it as we should. And we can make a mess of things when we try to do something biblically without studying God's law, trying to, to find out exactly what it is teaching and trying to apply it. We sometimes need to get a little bit deeper uh, in what we discuss in our Bible studies uh, at times and what we do. Uh, Paul told Timothy to give attendance to reading. In 1 Timothy 4 and verse 13, Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Now, what do you tell Timothy? You give attendance to that. You continue in it. Continue reading. Continue studying. Trying to find out all that you can about what God wants us to do. Do any of us know everything that's in this book? I'll be the first one to admit, I don't. That's why i got to sit down and study. That's why every one of us got to study. I don't know anyone that understands and, and knows everything that is included within this Bible. Everything. Now, I know men that can quote scriptures. Used to be a preacher. Uh, well, Mark used to be, when he went blind, that's what he did. He quoted the scriptures. Now there are those that can quote scriptures, but can they tell you what it means? How to apply? And most of the time they can't. And that's the problem. We, we got to give full attendance to what God has to say. Also, Paul told Timothy uh, in yeah, I just read that verse, uh, to, to give attendance to exhortation. Study it. Teach it. Teach it to others, to doctrine, to understand what we need to, to do to be found righteous before God. We won't be able to teach others about God's words. We don't know it ourselves. And we won't be able to obey God's word if we don't know it. Uh, and... Uh, 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, verses 1 and 2. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to cardinal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, but until now we are not able to receive it. And even now you're still not able. 
Think about it. How much have we grown over the years in our knowledge of the Bible? Sometimes we know the basics, and that's all we ever get to do, know the basics. There are deeper thoughts, deeper teachings within this Bible that we need to learn to apply to ourselves. But the only way we can do that is to study and teach it. Get in a little bit deeper. And as I always said, the more you study uh, God's Word, the more you learn, the more you want to learn. Because there are other things and questions that you'll have that you want to a- get answers for. And we only can do that only by studying God's Word. Turn over to Hebrews, the fifth chapter, beginning of verse 11. Of whom we have much to say and hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Again, talks about us being as babes. We need to grow. Just like a child is born, you give it milk at first. Now after it reaches a certain age, you start giving it a little bit more solid food. It got to grow into eating. And we got to nurture that child. And that's the same way as we as Christians, we need to we need to work with those uh, that are babes in Christ and try to get them to understand uh, what God's Word has to say. And the only way we can do that is sitting down and studying God's Word. Now, again, when we talk about a lawnmower, how many times you flooded out the engine? I've done that several times. You stand there, you crank on that string and pull, and, and you play with the uh, throttle and, and all of a sudden you start smelling a little bit of gasoline <laughs> and you get that odor and you know you flooded it. Now you got to wait a little bit for it to, to calm down before you try to start pulling that string again. Because if you don't, you're not going to get it started. So again, it is something that we need to apply to ourselves. In Luke the 8th chapter, verse 14, now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity. When you think about a lawnmower getting flooded out, for what? Too much gas. As individuals, when we go to study God's Word, sometimes we let life flood us out. We get flooded by the cares of this world, the worries of of these things that are taking place around us. I've known some individuals that are so worried about uh, the things that are going on within this world that they actually have forgotten God. And that's a shame that that happens. And sometimes our life just so flooded out And the cares of this world will take us over. And we need to learn to put that aside. And sometimes we neglect our spiritual lives because we're so caught, because we're watching TV all the time, trying to find out what's going on. Or it's going to be a nuclear war, or or there's going to be wars over in uh, certain countries. We've got to keep an eye on North Korea constantly on a basis. We got to do this. We got to do that. Our economy is falling apart. Did you let those things really worry you? Do we sit there and watch the news for those reasons instead of studying God's word and finding out He'll take care of these things? That He'll He'll provide a way for us within this life. And sometimes we get to the point where we just get so caught up 
Well, I got I got to work overtime so I can make a uh, living and, and things on this order. It overtakes us. We get so concerned about the things around about us that we actually forget about God until a major problem comes up. You ever think about 9-11? What's the first thing people wanted to do? Go go to, to their churches and, and tabernacles and, and whatever and pray to God to, to help deliver us from our enemies. And we'd done that for about a month or two, and then what happened? We all got concerned about the world and, and the things that are going on and about us, uh, the me generation, as we call it, the I. Uh, how, how do I feel, or, or I got to do this, because this is what I want. Uh, in First Timothy, the sixth chapter, verses 9 and 10, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and to many foolish and har harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith and their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Did it say money is evil? evil? It didn't say money. The love of money. How many times have you heard uh, somebody being uh, indicted because they confiscated money in a wrong way? I think they had three indicted over in, the, uh, over in Ohio just lately because they, they siphoned money and, and pocketed money in their pockets. And you not only hear about them, we hear about that about a lot of people that has the opportunity to take uh, the money that is around and uh, try to rip uh, different places off. And the thing is, it's for nothing. Money is not going to get you to heaven. Also in verse 10 of the chapter we just read, for demon has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica, Cesarean for Galatia, Titus for the Matria. Demons what, do what? He loved the present world so much that he left Paul. And there are some that within the body of Christ will leave the church because they're so involved in, the, in trying to, to make what they can, as much as they can. Also in 1 John, and uh, second chapter, in verse 15 through 17, it says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. What are we to avoid? The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. And we let all these three things sometimes drag us away from doing God's word. I tell Jim, my son, once in a while when we're home, because I'm always on the laptop, and he says, he says, don't you ever get off this thing? <laughs> I said, there's nothing on TV. So that's a good time for me to sit down and study <coughs> and try to find out what I can, what I need to learn to, to get material ready for, for Bible study or for a lesson. Do we take that opportunity? Or we do something else? We need to understand that we need to put God first within our lives. And let those things take care of themselves at this certain point. That battery won't fire. Uh, I never really used much of a riding mower until I got out to around Eric's and, and the church buildings. <laughs> and uh, didn't really know a whole lot about them, but I do know how to drive one but, and get it started, but that's about it. Uh, but the thing is, 
You got a dead battery, just like your automobile, you're going to go very far. <laughs> My son wanted to blow up a, a bed one night. When we were out Eric's, we bought an air mattress. And he says, uh, let me go out and blow it up. And so he gave him the keys for the car. He was out there for about three hours. I was like, what's taking that boy so long? I walked out and, and asked him, I said, what's going on? And he told me the problems he was having. He got blown up, went out the next morning. Guess what I had? Dead battery. <laughs> Cost me 200 bucks. I wasn't too happy with him at the time. But the thing is, we can't go anywhere with a dead battery. I had to have somebody take me down someplace to get, get the battery that I needed. I had to depend upon somebody else. And sometimes a dead battery uh, causes more problems and, and heartaches and headaches than we really like to do or have at times. And right now, uh, an individual uh, would t- tell me once in a while that his front riding mower that was so dead that uh, he had to try to deal with it, but he didn't have time to go get it, uh, that uh, it was starting to collect rain, <laughs> rainwater, because he just wasn't able to move it. So again, we have that problem. Jesus understands that we need a break from the light. Turn with me to Mark, the sixth chapter, verse 30. Then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. But he said to them, Come aside by, my, by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there are many coming and going, and they that not even had time to eat. When you get so busy in life, you don't take time to, to do the things you need, really need to do. I know I've been harped on. I don't drink enough water. Uh, I need to take a, take a break now and then. I was taught and raised that way. You do a job, you get it done, and no matter how long it took, then you quit. And sometimes you need that break. And as I got older, I finally realized, yeah, I, I need to take a five, ten minute break once in a while. I do need to drink more water. I do need to get away from something and and relax. And we all need that. And sometimes, and the good thing about this congregation is when we put a teacher's list up, the teacher gets six months to teach. And then what? Most of the time, we get a break because somebody else will fill in for the next six months. And that's good that that happened, because it gives us a break. In other words, we, we need to step aside once in a while. I'm not saying that we stop attending services or, or, or studying, but we do need to take a break in, in some of the work that we do. And sometimes, like a preacher, he needs that vacation. He needs to get away, because of all the problems he deals with within the congregation. A lot of people don't understand what a preacher goes through or an elder of a congregation in trying to deal with certain situations. And they do need that break. They need to get away. And just like that dead battery, we, we need to get rejuvenated. We need to, to, to take that rest at times. Elam was one of the first places that Israel came to after crossing the Jordan. In Exodus, the 15th chapter, in verse 27, it talks about how they had to take a break. And it told us about there's 12 wells and there's 70 palm trees. And that's the place that they needed to recharge because they were traveling through the wilderness. And they needed that break. They needed that rest. And we need that at times. 
So we do need to, to, to slow down at, at certain situations. Then finally, uh, safety equipment should not be removed. I'll, I'll admit I'm guilty of one of them. When I had to push more and they kept plugging up, I took that piece of plastic off the side so it wouldn't do that anymore because it would catch the grass and, and keep it from blowing out. You should never do that. I thought of being smart and make it easier. It didn't make it any easier. <laughs> They had the same problems. They're still plugged up at times because the grass was wet and, and just caught and just started piling up behind each other. But there are certain things that are on lawnmowers that we should never disconnect. I know some of the riding lawnmowers got a gauge underneath the seat. If you raise up a little bit, it shuts off. Now you got lawn mowers that push mowers. You got the, the the handle, and you got a little bar that you hold on to and help pull you along to, to mow. And you let go of that, and then sometimes it quits on you, and it gets a little bit harder to push. <laughs> so those things are on for safety reasons to keep us from getting hurt. They have things go wrong within our life. And the fact is that uh, that little uh, plastic piece behind the lawnmower, especially the push mower, uh, I took that off one time. And on, on some individual's yard, I always had a habit of putting my foot up when I pulled the lawnmower back. Well, I didn't understand. I was down into a little divot in the yard. And guess what? It went right over my foot. I felt something cross my toes. And I hurried up and shoved it forward and just took the top of the, my tennis shoe <laughs> off. Toes were good, but it was scary. And I thought, i got to quit doing that. And I did. I, I quit because I want to keep my feet, my toes. <laughs> but there were safety equipment that God has put in that we need to put in for our protection and because we need them. We think life would be easier if we do certain things and not do other things. But God has placed those things in His words for our benefit and our protection. Our best interest in mind, and many times we don't view it that way. Why does God call us to worship Him every first day of the week? Study His Word, sing praises to Him, to remember His death and resurrection. We know that we need to come together to help us and aid us in our spiritual life, that we get built up with one another. But do we? Do we take advantage of those things? Let's think of some of the ones that we need. Several of them tells us to do things to one another. That's love one another. Owe no man anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. We're to care about one another. We need to, to nurture each other. That's what we're here for. To help us through our times and needs within this life. How to deal with them. And again, we are to prefer one another. In Romans the 12th chapter, verse 10. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor giving preference to one another. We need to associate with one another more often. We need to, to be there. We need to, to get involved uh, with those that we attend worship God with. Again, in Romans the 15th chapter, verse 14, to, to abolish one another. I am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you are also full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to abolish one another. Now, where's to teach? To work. To help each other understand God's Word a little bit better. Maybe I don't understand the Scripture a certain way. Maybe somebody can help me. 
understand that verse by talking, by, by discussing what God's Word has to say. Maybe a thought will come up that I never thought about that was included within that verse or so. And it makes sometimes it makes a difference. We're to admonish one another. Again, Galatians, the sixth chapter, verse 2. Bear with one another's burden, and so fulfill the law of Christ. We're to be there. We're to help them in their time of need. We're just sitting down and talking with them, or whatever. Maybe they need help at home. We can do that. We can go to their house and maybe, uh, maybe they're not good cooks and, and take some food down to them where they cook because they're sick. It used to be a common thing among the church members years ago. But we've gotten away from, from certain things. And uh, again, we need to, to work on these things. God forbids drunkenness and fornication. Why is this when the world enjoys these things so much? This is for our benefit. You ever see all the problems they have? I imagine each one of us knows somebody that drinks heavily. What kind of problems do they have? What things do they have to deal with? And again, those who are involved in fornication, we see, we hear about all the type of diseases and things on that order, the problems it causes within the family, relationship, and those with their children and such. And so many lives are ruined by these type of sins, and that could be avoided if God's word was just heeded. All restrictions God places on his children are there for our benefit and will help us to lead the abundant life that God wants us to lead. Turn with me to John, the 10th chapter, verse 10. A thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they may have light, and that they may have it more abundantly. Everything we need to have within this life has been given to us by God's Word. All we got to do is study it and apply it to ourselves. And the problem is, we don't do that enough. Do we act like lawnmowers at times? Yeah, we do. We have the same problems that lawnmowers have. Sometimes we get flooded out. Sometimes we get not dealing with the problems as soon as and quickly as we should. Things on this order, we need to, to make sure that we do things in accordance to God's Word. I hope this lesson has been beneficial to all, make you think a little bit that we need to do things in accordance to God's will. As taught this morning, God does not appreciate sin, and He condemns it, and we can lose our soul for eternity. And uh, that's a scary thought, how God can be. But He also can be loving. He loved us enough to send His Son down to die upon the cross to relieve us of our sins. All we got to do is become obedient. If you have not become a Christian yet, you must hear his word, believe, repent, confess, be baptized by immersion, and live a faithful life to death, receive heaven as your home. If you become a Christian, you've turned your back on God and fell away, we need to make it right. We need to go to God in prayer. We'll ask for forgiveness of those sins. And we as other Christians will try to help you get through your trials and tribulations. Please, do something about it before it's eternally too late after saying the song.